Well, as Pastor Billy said, it's certainly good to see everyone here this morning. Of course, there's some very special people in my life that are here this morning. Well, everyone here is special, but I've got some members of my family that surprised me this morning that are here. And here we are at Southgate Ministries on a very special day for our country. Today is, of course, the 4th of July. It's when, as a country, we celebrate our independence, our victory that we had during the Revolutionary War. But one thing that, you know, I'd like to mention that we should never forget that this victory that we had during the Revolutionary War, this freedom that we have, came at a great cost. It was, of course, at the cost of the many brave soldiers that died during the Revolutionary War. But even more importantly, for our souls, it was Jesus, our Savior and King of Kings. And also on a personal level for me, this date is very important because today happens to be, as many of us know, my beautiful wife's birthday. So happy birthday, Janet. I love you. I'd like to begin by mentioning a name, Oliver Wendell Holmes. How many people here know who he is? Well, I'll tell you in case you don't know. Oliver Wendell Holmes was a Supreme Court Justice at one time, from quite a while ago, from 1902 through 1932. And in the Supreme Court, he rose to the level of Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. It's very well known back then, very well respected, even today in many circles he's talked about, he's admired. Some of the cases that he presided over in the United States Supreme Court are still brought up today. Chief Justice Holmes was a staunch supporter. He was an advocate for the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, which, by the way, guarantees our freedom of religion, freedom of expression, the right to assembly and petition, and the right to speak freely. Well, I'd like to share an interesting little story about this former Chief Justice of the United States. As brilliant as he was, as sometimes happens to people, myself even, when you get a little bit older, you become a little bit more forgetful. Now, as the story goes, Chief Justice Holmes was traveling or riding on a train. So imagine this, if you will. Here he is, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Chief Justice of the United States, sitting on his train seat. Maybe he's reading a newspaper or a magazine. Maybe he's just gazing out the window at the passing scenery. Maybe he's got some legal dockets open that he's going over for something that's coming up in court. But whatever the case, there he is. And down the aisle of the train, you could hear the sound of footsteps and the voice saying, ticket please, ticket please. Ticket, please. That, of course, is the voice of the train conductor going down the aisle, asking people for their tickets. So here he is, the train conductor, walking down the aisle. He's looking at the tickets, and he's got this little handheld device, and <laughs> he's punching all these tickets as he sees them. Ticket, please. Ticket, please. He's approaching now, 
Chief Justice Holmes. And as he's walking up towards him, obtaining the tickets from the passengers, he could see Chief Justice Holmes up in the distance a little bit, frantically looking through his pockets. He's looking in his pants pocket. He's looking in his shirt pocket. He's looking in his jacket pocket. He's opening up his briefcase, looking through his briefcase for that ticket. Can't find it. He's becoming more and more frustrated with himself with every step that the conductor takes towards him. Ticket, please. Ticket, please. So now, as the conductor is right upon Mr. Holmes, he could see how frustrated the Chief Justice is, and he's going through his briefcase again, looking for that ticket. Well, the train conductor kind of chuckles to himself as he's watching Mr. Holmes looking for that ticket, and he says, Justice Holmes. He says, really? He says, I know who you are. Everybody knows who you are. There's really no need for you to show me your ticket. And after he said this, Justice Holmes looked at him, and he replied, no, sir, you don't understand. That's not the problem. The problem is, I don't remember. I don't know where I'm going. Well, I know that might sound kind of funny, perhaps, but I mean, here he is, this man sitting on a train. He's going someplace, but he doesn't know where it is that he's going. He doesn't know what his final destination is. So stop and think about it for a moment, if you will. Doesn't that kind of remind you to a certain degree of people's lives? They're going through life just like sitting on a train. And the truth of the matter is that they're all going to wind up, according to Scripture, in one of two places. Am I correct? Well, we all know what a ticket looks like, right? They give you a ticket when you go to the movies, when you go to a sporting event, when you go to a concert or maybe a play. It shows that you paid the price of admission. It's proof that you did so, correct? So let's just pretend that there is an actual ticket that a person gets when they go to heaven. Hmm. I happen to have one. Of course, it's not a real ticket to heaven, but it might say, ticket to heaven. And then, what do we have on a ticket? It might say, admit. Well, who's it going to admit? Well, let me see. On this ticket that I've got here, it says, as many as believe, see John 3.16. Oh, okay. Well, let's check it out and see what John 3.16 says. I think you're familiar with this verse, Kara. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, eternal life, life forever. Well, that's pretty great, isn't it? Whosoever, no one special, it's whosoever, anybody and everybody can have this choice. Well, what else might be on this ticket? Oh, according to the ticket I've got here, it says price. Well, I guess that's a good thing to have on a ticket. How much did it cost? So, 
what's, what's the price for me? What would be the price for you if you were holding this ticket? Well, according to this ticket that I've got here, it says, it's a free gift. It's a free pass. Read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. All right, well, let's read that one and see what that says. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And in that book, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not on your own doing. It's a gift. It's the gift of God. It's not the result of works or anything that you do. It's not how much money you give or acts of charity that you do. It's a free gift from God so that no one may boast that it's because I did this or I did that. It's a free gift from God. Oh, well, I see. I get it. It's a gift from God. He gave it to me. He gave it to you. Ah, wait a minute, though. I like to get free things just as much as anybody else. But, you know, if it's free to me, then being a logical, analyzing, analytical type person, I'd have to say that it had to have cost somebody something. Oh, yes, it did. It says, to see John 15, 13. Well, let's see what that says. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And of course, we know that that someone that paid the price for this ticket paid a very big price. And that someone, of course, was God's only son, Jesus. Well, that's really amazing, I think. Stop and think about it. Jesus did it all. There's nothing else to be done. There's no further price of admission. So what is it that people have to do to get this ticket, so to speak? Well, again, as we read in John 3.16, it said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, of course, I just mentioned John, an apostle of Jesus. Now I'd like to mention another great apostle of Jesus, and that's the apostle Paul. Paul shares the very same thought as the apostle John. Now, in the 16th chapter of Acts, we can read how at one time Paul and Silas were actually thrown in prison for sharing this gospel message of, with people. And Paul himself is sharing with others, as I said, how to be saved, the true gospel message. So let's turn to it and see how Paul is sharing the same thought as that of the Apostle John that I just read by turning to Acts 16, 25 through 31. And it goes to say in this chapter in the Bible that about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, just as we did this morning. And the prisoners were listening to them. 
And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. It was so great, in fact, that the verse goes on to say that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Now when the jailer awoke and saw that the prison doors were open, guess what he did? He drew his sword, and he was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Now this would be quite customary during this time. This was a Roman soldier who was put in charge over all these prisoners. And while under his charge, if they were to escape, his penalty would have been death. So what he was doing, he was going to kill himself rather than be killed. But now Paul cries out with a loud voice, the scripture goes on to say. And he says, do no harm for yourself. We're all here. So the jailer called for the lights, torches to be lit, and he rushed in. And he was trembling with fear. And he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought the two of them out. And he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And this is what they told him. Much what John said in John chapter 3, verse 16. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will. It's not that maybe. He said you will be saved. You and your household. So what do we see from these two verses? It is through our belief in Jesus that we are saved. So furthermore, I just want to point this out, that when we are saved, all of our sins are forgiven. Our past sins, our present sins, our future sins. When we put our hope and our trust in Jesus and ask for his forgiveness and accept him into our heart as our Savior, it's a done deal. The past, future, our present sins are all forgiven. No matter how small, how great, if there was just a few, or if there were many, many sins, Jesus takes them all away. He forgave our sins. So let's look at John 3.16 again. It says that whosoever believes in him, and in Acts chapter 16 at the very end, it says, believe in the Lord Jesus. Both of these verses pointing to the same thing. Belief in Jesus saves us. Now, what is it that both of these verses point to or confirm or give support to? It's simply this act on your part and on my part, and again, that is belief. Belief in Jesus, the Son of God. And there's much more, very much more, that I could share about this. But for now, let's leave it at this, that Jesus, if you want to call it, our belief in Jesus and his finished work on the cross is our ticket to everlasting life. Now, I told you a little bit about Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. I'd like to share just a little bit about another true story about someone that I grew up greatly admiring for his wonderful musical abilities. His name was Luciano Pavarotti. I'm sure that many of us here might be familiar with Luciano Pavarotti. He's, of course, acclaimed as one of, if not the greatest tenor voice of all times. He recorded, he performed many moving arias and operas. My own personal favorite song that he sang from one of these operas was 
called Nassim Dorme, which means in Italian, nobody sleeps. He also performed this same song at the 2006 Winter Olympics in Turin, Italy. I think it was a particularly fitting song to perform at the Olympics because at the end of the song, it rises into a crescendo. That final word in that song is sung not once, not twice, it's sung three times. And each time it's sung more powerfully with greater meaning and feeling. And that song, of course, it's sung in Italian, and the Italian word for that last word that he speaks in that song is vincero. Vincero, which means in Italian, is simply this, victory. What he's saying in this aria is that he won. He has victory. He was victorious. He was a conqueror. Vincero. But at least in the story that was portrayed by the song, he has victory. Sadly, tragically, Luciano Pavarotti passed away the following year from pancreatic cancer. You might be wondering, why am I mentioning this today? Well, I think you might get a better understanding of it as I go on a little further. Here he was, Luciano Pavarotti. He was admired by millions of people around the world, not only for his amazing musical talents and voice, but also because he was such a generous, giving person to many charitable organizations around the world. Now here he is. He's on his deathbed. He knows that he doesn't have much longer to live. And he tells his loved ones that are there with him that he's afraid. Afraid because he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He doesn't know where he's going. So, what is going to happen to him, he's wondering. What's going to happen to him when he breathes his last breath? That very same breath that for many years thrilled audiences around the world. How very sad for Mr. Pavarotti. If only someone could have shared with him the words of the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians 15.57. So why don't we look at that? 1 Corinthians 15.57, where it says, But thanks be to God, thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That stirring word that Luciano Pavarotti sang so powerfully, vincero, or victory, is what Jesus gave to all of those who believe in him as their personal Lord and Savior. Jesus won the victory over death. Jesus was victorious. And those of us who pin our hope and our trust on Jesus, in Jesus, we have that same victory. That once we take our last breath here on earth, our very next breath will be in the presence of our Lord Jesus. Victory is ours. It's ours already. Life eternal is ours already. Paul went on to say this to the people in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. He writes, 
But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, in other words, those who have died or passed away, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and then rose again, even so, through Jesus, and again, Jesus is who we pin our hope on, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Jesus did it all for us. His death, his burial, and his miraculous resurrection. And our belief in that, that's our guarantee. That's our ticket that we have to everlasting life. Verse after verse and passage after passage in the Holy Scriptures proclaims this same wonderful good news. I think that some of the strongest words on this subject were, of course, spoken by none other than Jesus himself. Let's see what some of these words are in John, the 10th chapter, verses 28 through 30. Jesus himself is saying, I give them eternal life. Goes on to say, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now I know that the words that Jesus spoke in some translations of the Bible are all in red letters. Right, Harvey? <laughs> and for sure those words that I just read are certainly red letter words that Jesus spoke Jesus gives, as it said, eternal life. Jesus promises that if you trust and believe in him, that you will never, ever perish. No one else has the power or authority to overturn, to reverse these words and this promise that Jesus has given to us. He, Jesus, has put you in the most secure place that you could ever find yourself. According to the scripture that we just read, where are we? We are in the Father's hand. And he promises us that no one could snatch us out of the Father's hand. You are in a safe and secure place in Jesus. Neither Jesus nor God the Father will ever lose their grip on you. So think about it. You are in the hand of the God, the creator of the entire universe. You've been placed there by Jesus Christ himself. Now, again, I would say that is assurance of salvation. We have victory. Vincero, we are victorious. We are conquerors. One more scripture, please. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39. Now in all these things, he goes on to say, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And that, of course, is Jesus. For I am sure, in other words, I'm telling you people, I'm very, very, very confident that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, Nothing else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from 
the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that, my friends, that, my friends, is the ultimate, very highest Christian assurance. Nothing can separate us from God's love. When our hearts belong to Jesus, it's not just our hearts that belong to Jesus, it's our very future. In Jesus, our future with him is glorious, it's victorious, and it's unending. And with that said, I'd just like to close with a word of prayer, please. Our Father, we want to...